Welcome to Talking Giants presented by Seek Geek. I'm your host, Bob Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. We got an interview. We got an interview with Dan Schneier of the Big Blue Banter podcast. Uh, he works for CBS Sports. We have him on every year after the draft. So always a good interview. Just recapping the draft, getting stuff from another point of view, and, and talking about the Giants overall. Justin, how you feeling, my man? With North Carolina, Friday. Friday, we're going to be there. Yeah, stay tuned for like specific details on that. We've been kind of vague. I mean, we, we put out a graphic on our socials if you want something, a screenshot, and just have. Um, if you're coming out, we really appreciate you, but just stay tuned for updates the day of. Don't know exactly where we're going to be. Um, the, there's not a lot of space that you can kind of navigate around the track, so just, just, just stay tuned. Stay tuned for where we're going to be at and where we're going to be hanging out. Hi, Bobby Skinner. Uh, excited for everybody to listen to this Dan Schneier interview. I mean, I I really think it's us and Big Blue Banter, Dan Schneier, Nick Filato in terms of uh you know the most in depth giant stuff that you're gonna get. And Dan's awesome every single year, like you said, getting that different perspective. Um, we talked about most of these draft picks. Uh, he has Kayvon Thibodeau as like edge rusher number one over Aiden Hutchinson, and then even like the last question that I asked about like personnel grouping frequencies about what we're gonna see this year. I thought even thought like that was fun at the end in terms of how different it's gonna be from the Judge and the Garrett era. So um, recorded some bleeding blue episodes with snacks today on uh on Sunday. I'm excited for the big fifty episodes that we're gonna have from Bleeding Blue Giants History Show. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. No doubt. All right, we're gonna get into the Dan Snyder interview first. Slide into stacks of cash this baseball season with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. New customers can bet just $5 on any team to win and get $150 in free bets no matter what, win or lose. By the way, Yankees Twitter uh, getting all butthurt because Snack said he was going to boo a lot of people it was pretty funny. And then I was so excited that he was going to be at the office in Manhattan because as he was driving to the office, I'm like, we are going to take such an awesome picture. Menace of Yankees Twitter, Snacks BDGE, um, in the office that is like known for like being Yankee fans. Yeah, one of Man. our even one of our employees got butt hurt. Um, so they can suck it. Look to turn uh, a small bet into a big payday during MLB season with DraftKings same game parlays. You can do just that. Create your own parlay by combining multiple bets like which team will win, how many bases will be stolen, total runs, and more. It's your shot at an even bigger payout. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. Best of all, you deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code JOHNBOY. Bet just $5 and get $150 in free bets no matter what happens on the field. That's promo code JOHNBOY at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. And will be trademark used with permission. And here's Dan Schneier. All right, welcome back to the show. And now joining us, we have... Dan Schneier from the Big Blue Banter Podcast. Not Schneer, not Schneider. What's a what's a funky pronunciation you've got of your name recently? Oh, I have Schneer is usually the most funky. I mean, oh, everybody fun. typically tends to do Schneider because it's yeah. easy, but usually it's Schneer. And I, I make this joke all the time because it's true. I still have like, I'd say 25% of my good friends from home that still don't know how to spell my last name. So, <laughs> so you're just going to live with that your whole life. And every year, fail none, I get two things. About three to five angry tweets thinking that I'm Dan Snyder, the Redskins owner. Oh, yeah. the, sorry, the football team. Sorry, the commander's owner. I keep every podcast I do commander. I go from Redskins to football team to commander, like sure. in that order. And I mess it up every time. And I'm now I'm getting this one sucks. Now I'm getting angry, like DMs and tweets conf, uh, confusing me for Dan Schneider, who was like the old Nickelodeon, like, yeah. like guy. But like apparently he's like a massive creep who was into like he has a foot fetish and like did weird screwed up things on the sets of those weird Nickelodeon like good girls and it's it's fucked up and i'm not oh, i'm sorry my bad I didn't no you're to, good you're good well just listeners make sure the tweet at dan like loved your appearance on talking yeah. giants even though he has this weird foot fetish thing it's so bad and i'm just like this is not me please i'm neither of these two people interviewed you back in 2019 and uh my buddy david powis and i uh i probably spent like maybe half an hour with him on the phone being like we dude before we have this like legit Giants guy on, we got to get his name. That's like number one. We got to get the name right. So um, I just like Dan, that you uh, consider me a legit Giants guy. So I'll no, take that I'll, I'll take as a win. Absolutely. You were like our first uh, Giants interview. So thank you for coming on, Bobby. Yeah, one of our one of mine and Justin's first interactions was me referencing like we're gonna have Dan Snyder on the podcast, and he messaged me like, "No, that's Dan Snyder, no, not Dan Snyder." Uh, don't <laughs> don't do that. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's always good to have you on, man. You were one of our, you know, 
you know, it's uh, it's been cool to see us grow and you guys grow at the same time, you know, with, with you and Filato. We have Filato on every year pre-draft to preview mid-round prospects, and we had a streak of him predicting Giants players, and that, that ended up getting lost this Broke. year. With one of the guys that he we talked about, which was the one I was hoping for the most, what happened to our guy Leo Chanel, man? Like, I... I I, I, I do my final mock draft, and I put him at 67, and I got a bunch of comments being like, he's not going to be there at 67. And I usually hate those replies, but I was like, I kind of get it with this one. Dude went 90th. What happened to him? Yeah, I'm guessing what happened was just if we if we look at like just what happened with all the off-ball backers, they all seem to fall in this draft, mm. with the exception of the two the Jaguars traded up for and just made a priority to get. It seems like they all just fell. And Ch- I guess with Chanel, in Chanel's case, it was just like, no one felt he was a fit for their system or no one felt like, you know, he's going to be able to cover. He's going to be able to flip his hips and drop back in coverage. We'll see, like you said, and I think we both agree on this, Bobby, that was more of he wasn't asked to do it than he can't do it. I'm not saying he will be able to do it. Like obviously these NFL teams believe he probably won't be able to, which is why he fell, but we'll see. I feel like Spax is going to use him really well in that system. Just like I thought the giants would too. And you know what, honestly, what, what killed me most about the pick Bobby was the giants went with McFadden, not too many picks after that. I'm pretty sure if Chanel fell a little bit further, the Giants would have taken him. Yeah, he, he's a guy I'm going to be paying attention for the next few years. Like, was I right or was the NFL right? Yeah. You know? So that'll, that'll be one of those guys for me. But the worst yeah. thing about that, Bobby, I just want to make this one comment because you do so much work on the draft and we all do. But, like, it's not – if these guys aren't good in their first four years, it doesn't mean you were definitely wrong because it we don't know where they're going to get drafted to. And the fit with team and the fit with system plays such a huge role in this. Like someone like that we liked a lot, me and Nick, Zach Bond, at another guy out of Wisconsin. He hasn't really caught on with the Saints yet because he joined an insanely crowded linebacker depth chart, and he's not really a fit for that system. So I just feel like sometimes it's like they can get buried in the wrong spots. Yeah. So we're talking about Leo Chanel. Um, You know, I know we were talking a little bit before about Bobby throwing a temper tantrum before we came on. Throwing not yeah, throwing a temper tantrum that he didn't know who Cordell Flott was. um, You know, day day two of the draft. So I want to get your thoughts just on the the NFL draft as whole, not just Giants draft. And this is when we usually have you on is after the NFL draft. So. How do you feel like this NFL draft went as a whole? Did you find that there were a lot of teams that were kind of quote unquote reaching from what the consensus had? You know, how do you feel like just the draft went um, a- as a whole? Yeah. The draft had to be that the receiver run happened. And whenever, whenever you see a run like that happen, you expect it to end at some point. It just never did. And it ultimately led to a lot of picks that people think are quote unquote reaches. For example, Wandell Robinson for the Giants or Tyquan Thornton for the Patriots or Avilas Jones for the Be- the Bears, a player who I actually like me and Nick talked about him with Laurie Fitzpatrick before the podcast. But we're like, yeah, this is like a day three late guy because he's 25 years old. And you see these guys all push up the board, Danny Gray, another one. And I feel like what we're seeing now is wide receivers becoming a position of more importance for these teams to invest in the draft. We're going to see this continue, I think, throughout drafts, not just because there's a lot of talent. There's always been a lot of talent in the position. But now because these positions, this position is getting paid so much on these contracts, it's like, well, we don't want to be caught in a situation like the Titans were or like the Chiefs were, where we have to either pay these guys and kill our cap and defer money to future years with players we don't want to or trade them not pennies on the dollar, but you're not really getting a great return. Like what the Titans got back. Everybody's like, Oh, Traylon Burks could be the next AJ Brown. That's not necessarily true. These are all gambles. Every draft pick is a gamble and there's bust rates at every position, even wide receiver, especially wide receiver. And so they're not, there's the guaranteed player in AJ Brown. Then there's the guesswork on, yeah, on someone like Traylon Burks. So I think what you're going to see is a lot of teams trying to hit on these guys in rounds two and three, so they can have the four year contract. And even then it's like, if you hit too big, these guys are going to ask for a new contract earlier than the four years anyway. So that was interesting to me. And the other thing was the quarterbacks. I felt like, and I spoke with a lot of people after the draft, I felt like there was almost an overcorrection at the quarterback position. Like Sam Howell has a ton of flaws with him. I'm not coming on here to say Sam Howell was an insanely great pick by the commanders. But you just don't see that kind of arm talent going in round five in most drafts. Like the Giants, for example, took took um, what's his name? The kid from uh, the why am I from Kyle Laletta? Like Kyle Laletta couldn't I was even say throw there's an a lot out. of them. I couldn't fill in the blank for you. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of these late round quarters. Kyle Laletta, when he tried to throw an, a, a deep ball. 30 yards down the field. It went inside the receiver's inside shoulder every single time. He didn't have NFL arm talent. Now you got a guy like Sam Howell who can run and he can throw. And I know he has a ton of issues, but I was just surprised to see some of these 
somewhat talented quarterbacks, though I know there's a ton of issues with their processing and other other reasons why you wouldn't want to draft them go so far and fall so far. I think those were the two things to me that really stood out there, the receivers and the quarterbacks. Yeah, I've kind of always had the mindset of like draft a QB in round one or don't draft at all. But yeah. then with Malik Willis, I was like, well, I feel like he can kind of be a little bit of the exception for the rule. And when he got picked, I don't. It was late in the third round, or maybe mid third round. I can't remember exactly. We're just like he's not like he's a better player than this. You know, this isn't. You know, we were we were so surprised. It's like he has all this ability, and I think some of his flaws were a little overblown. Um, the actually one was the biggest worry that I don't think was overblown at all. Um, but then it's like, well, put yourself in this position of the Giants. The Giants, you know, are, are most likely going to need a QB after next year, and they had. You know, they passed him up three times, and I don't think any, you know, nobody on the Giants is feeling bad about it. So it's kind of like, a, I don't think that's where you belong, but I also get, you know, teams passing on it because they don't want to make that investment. Um, I want to start at the top. You had Kayvon as your top pass rusher, I believe, right? Yep, Kayvon was my number one. Why him was over? Uh, the consensus had Aiden. Um, you know, I, 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 I had Aiden, but slightly. What was like the thing that put you over him? And we don't need to explain why he's over Trayvon Walker. Yeah, exactly with Walker. But the thing for me with Kayvon versus Aiden is, you know, you look at Aiden, he's a late breakout. He was not projected to go anywhere near the first overall pick before his final year. And then you look at what traits translate to the next level. I have a little bit of concerns with Aiden Hutchinson. The arm length to me does seem a little bit concerning. I'm not, I don't like to be this like, oh, you need to reach this threshold kind of guy. Because obviously the Giants draft some players that don't reach the certain quote unquote thresholds of arm length and things of that nature. But to me, I think it could hurt him at the next level because he doesn't have a defining trait. I felt like Kayvon Thibodeau had the defining trait, and that's the get-off off the line of scrimmage. And to me, I think that will translate better to the next level. We'll see what happens there because Hutchinson and a lot of people like more than Thibodeau. But for me, I thought Thibodeau had the higher ceiling and to, honestly the higher floor based on that trait. Yeah, it's kind of crazy going into this past year. It's like if the Giants had the first and second overall picks, who are you taking? And I think we would all have been like Evan Neal and Kayvon Thibodeau, you know, and – uh end up getting them at five and seven. Uh, so it's, it's pretty pretty Unreal. cool how, how it went down. Wandale goes at 43. Obviously, they trade back a couple times. Um, definitely a surprising pick, um, even if you've like convinced yourself of it. like It was definitely a surprising pick. I don't think anybody saw that happening. What's kind of your overall analysis of him? And not to say like you dislike the pick, but like what where was where were you like uh, needled in on at when we were at the clock on 43? Yeah, there were a lot of players I liked at 43. For starters, I was interested in a different, a couple different wide receivers. For me, it's it comes down to this. I trust the Giants on this because they have an idea of what they want to do with Wandale, and he's probably going to be able to make an impact earlier than some of these guys that I liked a little bit more long term. But if I'm going receiver in the top 50, I want the because remember that's like the range where people got AJ Brown. That's the range where people got DK Metcalf. You can still get an alpha wide receiver one there. I want somebody who has the size to play on the outside consistently. I want somebody who has the deep speed to kind of be that knife in the defense and force the safeties to play you a little bit differently. I thought George Pickens was that player to me. There was a case to be made that he could be the best receiver in this entire class. And so he probably is the direction I would have gone there. If you were going to go smaller type, I would have taken sky more, but again, like, the more you watch Wandale, the more you like him. I think that's one thing. And I think one thing that's interesting about Wandale is the way they're going to try to use him and you know provide these layups for Daniel Jones, these quick hitting layups. He has vision because he played running back, I think, that will help him in this specific role and in this specific vision that the Giants have for him. So I can't really knock the pick too much based on that. Obviously, there's some concern with like players of his size and height not hitting at the NFL level. But I think when you think about that with the context, because I did post a tweet on this and I was looking a little more deeply into some of the players that had failed and some of the players that had succeeded. And it's a short list of players that have succeeded. And it's like, I think it, you have to factor in the context, which is the NFL game has changed so much from like some of those picks that were made in the past, even like when the Giants took Sonoris Moss back in the day when they traded up for Sonoris Moss. Like the game has changed and the way they use these receivers has changed. And so, I think he has a better chance to succeed just because of that, but it was definitely the most surprising pick. And if I had to pick one pick I didn't like in this draft, it would be that one. Yeah, it's the five. You know, the the height thing definitely is a little worrisome, especially with some of the guys that were on on the board. Um, I'm going to be interested to see how he improves as a route runner because it, it was, yeah, you know, at Nebraska they used him all over the field, and so it's like you know he wasn't able to really hone in on work on route running, and then even at Kentucky where they used him a ton. They kind of turned him into an all or nothing player, you know, where it's like we're throwing you smoke screens or in the flats or we're hitting you on, you know, 
you know, 40 yard posts. Uh, you know, they kind of, you know, he didn't work the intermediate game. So you, there, you definitely see a lot of room for improvement there. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I don't no no, no fan was, uh, you know, banging for Wandale at, at pick 43 at that point. I think one thing that you just mentioned, Bobby, that int- that'll interest me about Wandale at the next level is immediately when the pick was made, I spoke to Josh Edwards, who works on our draft coverage at CBS Sports, and he also used to cover Kentucky for 24 at 7 Sports. So really, he's toned in on the team, and he's like, look, you got a good player here, but one thing that's going to be super important for Wandale is he needs to, he needs an accurate quarterback at all times. The ball placement has to be there. And that's something that me and Nick have discussed. We haven't done a big Wandale pod yet. We're planning to, but when we watch him run, like you said, those intermediate routes, which are going to define like how he translates the next level, the catch radius in the hands definitely come into play, at least in my mind and and Nick's mind from what we've seen. There are some drops he shouldn't be making on tape. Like the, the hand size could be an issue at the next level. And, and, and that's something he'll have to clean up. I don't know if that's, you know, some of that seems like it comes natural to me when I evaluate wide receivers as far as like if they're natural hands catchers or not. I wouldn't necessarily consider him that per se right now, but it'll be interesting to see because I think if you can get him the ball with good ball placement, he'll be a great player. But once that starts to wane and he's forced to catch a little bit away from his frame, that's some of the stuff I want to see him improve on. And we'll see if he can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it, one, of, one of my things too, with just find Wandell, we'll, we'll, we'll move on from him, but one of my things is the giants just haven't had any easy plays and if it's like hey yeah. well a little bit of a justification of taking a guy that led the nation in most like the manufactured targets right where catches at or behind the line of scrimmage is that in an, in a league that is about explosive plays you know wandell robinson may not be doing that consistently like hey maybe we want a kenny galladay to do but getting those you know easy plays of like those 10 to 15 15 to 19 yard plays um that's kind of where the league may be trending a little more t- more towards to when you see teams playing a lot of too high. So that's my little right. justification of Wendell Robinson. Yards after the catch. Um, it's a scheme that is you would think is going to be centered around yards after the catch, but it's also players like Tony and Robinson that are going to do that too. So um, one of my favorite questions that I like to ask you every year after the draft um, is about the Giants draft as a whole. Was there a theme? This is Joe Shane's first draft class as well. Was was there a theme in terms of, hey, is it versatility? They're all young. What was a the theme that you saw uh, if you had to summarize this Giants draft class? Yeah, I saw a few themes in this draft class from Joe Shane that really excite me. The first one would be youth. I mean, they're obviously prioritizing youth with the exception of uh, obviously their fifth round pick, their second fifth round pick. It's like you could see that they had a priority here on finding players who might develop into something that they haven't already been. And so the, the, the biggest example of that would be Cordell Flott. I think their third round pick. I think they envision him becoming a player that he hasn't exactly shown. And it'll be interesting to see, because I know he started off in the slot today. I have a vision for him that he could potentially be their, their outside corner in the future. And I'm excited about that, but we'll see if he comes, we'll see if that ever comes to fruition. Cause he could just end up being a really good slot guy for them. But obviously the aid, the youth was important. And, I, and another thing was trying to find a lot of got like replenishing their, their foundation, right? Like he traded back and the, the Wandale Robinson pick, if they took him at 36 is a lot different than after they traded back twice yep. to get him at 44 and then pick up the other assets that they picked up. So I think that was an excellent job, but I, mean, I think Joe Shane did an excellent job on that in the, in his first year. And I'm thinking of like one other theme. I was just thinking of that now it escapes me. I'm trying to think of where we're going with this. Cause you, what were the things you mentioned, Justin? Well, start? I also mentioned like ver- versatility was also versatility, one of those, that's, you know, I think yeah. that's just a, a relative theme kind of throughout too. No, but it's, uh, but it's definitely true in this class. You're right. Like a lot of these players can potentially play multiple positions, which is important for them. Um, but I'm trying the the last thing I would say is just, <sighs> sorry, I lost. My no, you're time. good. I, I, so I had I, something. In, yeah. You, you were, you were talking about Cordell Flott and you're talking about the secondary. And, you know, something that, you know, even just before, you know, before I was on Talking Giants, you know, I would listen to you guys, even going back to the days with Churchin, right? You know, you were outspoken about pass ru- or secondary over pass rush, you know, like the, the, the value of the secondary. So knowing that the Ravens defense last year with the similar secondary situation to the Giants this year, and I think that's kind of fair to say, knowing that they allowed the second most explosive plays in the National Football League, are you a little bit concerned? What's your outlook heading into this year with this giant secondary, especially because there's only a few guys that have vast NFL experience in the secondary? Yeah, I think it's funny, Justin and Bobby, because we've gone into last year and recent years and even this offseason, like, what's the problem? We've got to focus on the offense. The offense needs to get better. This offense is so putrid. I'm more worried about the defense right now than I am the offense. And that's not to say I don't think Kayvon Thibodeau can make a massive impact and Aziz Ojolari in year two. 
It's just to say, look, we take for granted what they had last year, which was year two in the same system on defense. And that leads to everyone can go back to the James Betcher years and say, well, part of the problem was just Betcher's system was bad. And he asked for too many things and the pattern match recognition on defense, all the things that he asked for just couldn't. But also part of it was they were learning a new system and they had to kind of transition from an old system that was very different. And they're going to be in our opinion, at least, we assume they're going to be running a lot more middle of the field close, cover one, man coverage on the outside versus last year they were one of the most zone-heavy teams in the NFL. Even when they tried to run more man, they would default back to zone. And I think we're going to potentially see, especially after losing Bradbury and kind of in injecting new players into the mix or players like Aaron Robinson who didn't really get that many reps on the outside last season, looked pretty good when he did, but didn't really get that many reps. We're going to see some coverage breakdowns that we haven't been used to. We're going to see some communication issues in the secondary and last year we saw it. And I think Bobby or you tweeted about this today. You wish somebody would have asked a question about, you know, what happened last year with Wink Martindale's defense, right? Like he had all those injuries. He had to put new faces in the secondary and things seemed to totally collapse. Well, they're going to have a lot of new faces in the secondary this year. And right now, not too many. We can certainly rely on outside of McKinney and Adoree Jackson for sure, at least. And so I'm curious to see if that will lead to some issues early on. And I think we got to be patient with it as Giants fans. Like it, it's not going to, if the pass defense is worse than it was last year, that despite adding talent on, you know, as the pass rusher with Kayvon Thibodeau, don't be too surprised because I think it's going to take some time to gel back there. Yeah. Who's, who are you throwing at that second outside corner? Cause it's, it's, uh, you could, it's, I mean, there's no really good answer, honestly. <laughs> There's no good answer right now. We're all kind of hoping, me, me included, it's going to be Aaron Robinson. Yeah. Look, Robinson, we thought would be a slot guy, but I will say this about Robinson. I was talking about this with Nick last show. It's like we we think back on his first game where he got some reps on the outside. And he did look pretty good on the outside, and it was limited. There's not a there's a small sample size, so you're really projecting there, like you said. It's not a great answer, but it's the best answer I think right now. I think ultimately Flock can do it, but right now it seems like you're going to start him at on the inside and and he still needs to like kind of grow into his body. I think, I think that's the key with thought. Yeah. He's not ready for year one to be that outside boundary corner. So right now you're right. It seems like there's no good answer. We're, we're all kind of hoping it's Robinson, but they may end up signing a veteran too on cheap there. So I, I agree with you that I can see Flaught eventually getting out there, even though, you know, this year, no, like even, even in the nickel, he'll probably struggle if he's thrown out there this year. But, um, what would you liked him, you know, pre-draft, what stood out to you like the most that made you be like, this is a guy I, I like, uh, for, you know, to whether, whether it was the fourth round or third round or whatever. Yeah. The things I liked the most about Flot were one, his confidence for me with cornerback at that position, you have to be a confident player and he is clearly a confident player in his abilities and in coverage too. I thought he clicked and closed really well, especially when he was in the slot. So that we'll see if that can translate three to me. He can, like, like we just said, he can still grow into his body. He is not the longest player by the metrics or by like the height or whatever, but he looks super long on tape and he, he has a really long frame and he's going to be able to grow into that frame well and put on weight and muscle in the right spot. So I think that he's going to be a much different athlete than, or a much different, I guess, yeah, total athlete in a few years when he's 24 or 25 than he is right now at 2021 20, range. And then the third thing for me is just I, the two things that stood out. One, we have Eric Crocker on every year, who's a former NFL defensive back who studies defensive backs and he loves Flots film. He's like, this kid is really good and has a chance to be really good. And then I, and then I heard, I believe it was on a podcast with Greg Cosell talking with the LS, someone who covered LSU down there. And there's like, yeah, how is Stingley? It was a whole Stingley Gardner being. He's like, look, keep an eye on Cordell Flot because he could play the inside and the outside. And he competed really well with those, the same LSU receivers who we, you know, we gave so much mm. credit for or at least some of them and so i think that honestly he just the upside for me really stands out with flop yeah he was definitely a fun player to watch like you mentioned you know he just springs out of his back pedal like it's, yep. it's just effortlessly and then yeah he's he's not the biggest guy and people want him to put on weight but he's very involved in the run game they even you know threw him at uh you know that deep safety a, a few times too at lsu like he's definitely a fun player but it's also like he's 20 years old it's got a lot of stuff to work on, so it's just, you know, it's a work in progress. I don't think – hopefully they're not, like, just throwing them out there, you know, right off right off rip. They give them a little time to develop, which is why I think they need to add a vet, a guy who's, like, you know, played outside corner. Even if the guy's 32 and a little washed up, I think they just kind of right. need that presence in that room because if a door goes down, like, it's – you know, it's – I mean, you look back at that 2019 secondary and it's like, man, this is – and that even had Janoris Jenkins who played halfway decent that year. Um, so – and, and Jackson's been injured each of the last four years, so it's yeah. it's not like yeah. you know you're you're banking on someone who never gets hurt. 
Yeah, and and he's going from where he dominated cornerback two to the you know now it's like okay now you're coming to watch your ones every yeah. single week. Um, favorite and least favorite uh, pick of day three. Of day three, favorite. Well, my favorite pick will certainly be Micah McFadden. I just mm. again he's not Leo Chano, but you could see a lot of Leo Chano light in his game, and he wasn't really on my radar until after the until after they drafted him. You know, you like you always talked about, or like you said on on the reaction show when when they picked Flot. Like we study all these players, and sometimes we just don't. Like some of these guys we just miss in the process, and he was one of the guys I missed. And I just feel like he can bring a lot of what I hoped Chano could bring to this specific defense. And the other thing for me is I've been looking for talent on the inside linebacker group for a long time. I'm personally not a big fan of Tate Crowder. And what I saw on tape last year, I thought he was a massive liability every week. Um, and that's, and that's not a knock on him, a good guy, good on him. Like you came from the, uh, you know, the last pick in the, in the draft to like starting on the NFL roster, but you don't really ultimately want him starting. I don't think so. That was probably my favorite pick. And you said the least favorite pick. Um, I don't really have a least favorite pick. Cause like, even, even like, you know, it's like you can point to all any of these picks and say, well, they at least have an, a vision for them and they have like an idea for them in year one and in the future. So I don't really have a least favorite pick. I know it's a cop out, but I yeah, can't, I I'm looking say, at that's the a cop out. Yeah. Just say I'm, DJ like, Davidson yeah, DJ, I was going to say on. DJ Davidson, but I'm like, <laughs> I know they need him and he's going to play a specific role for them. But I guess you could say, but I also they like should, what they you should said, have taken like, John Ridgeway out of Arkansas. Just three. Well, uh, yes. I, I talked about Ridgeway, like, but also like oh, what you yeah. said too. Like, I think Hinton is a better player than him right now and maybe in the future. So it's like, I don't even know. If, so fine. We'll go with Davidson. I think that's fair. Yeah, I, I always find one guy on day three. It's like yeah. never gonna play, and DJ Davis. Yeah, he probably thing. might. Like, look, look, Hinton might beat him out right away. It's possible. Um. So, yeah. Uh, finishing off, you know, the first, you know, day one and day two. I don't. We don't even need to talk about Evan Neal. We all know Evan Neal's freaking really good. But uh, I do want to talk about Evan Neal in the sense that I know he was. Was he your OT one? He was our OT. Both of our OT. So I struggled with him in Aquanu. Okay. And I last second I went Aquanu because it's just like I just wanted to bet on him getting better at some of the things that like his mm-hmm. pass protection and stuff. Um, but it was like, it was Justin saw like, it, you know, we didn't do it on air, but I'm like, man, I'm really struggling on who picked OT one OT two. So I'm just glad it wasn't cross. Well, yeah, I know you guys were at, you were, you weren't a big fan of cross for me. It was, Oh, it was Neil ahead of, of both of them. And then I was closer on cross versus Iquano. I do think Iquano has the most upside of at least definitely more upside than cross. I still feel like Neil has a really high ceiling though as well. Cause you, yeah, you see some yeah, of these guys does. at that size that just don't get beat. They're just too big to get beat. Like Orlando Brown Jr. is such a good example of this. Everyone's like, Oh, the metrics, he's going to be so bad. He tested so poorly and he just gets to the NFL level and he's too big to get around. Then he recovers. And I feel like Neil has a good, has shown a good, at least has shown me flashes of the ability to kind of translate to an elite pass protector at the NFL level. We'll see what happens in the run game. I thought only to be honest, only I thought Icky had like a lead upside as a run blocker. So we'll see what happens there. I think Neil can do a good job there. I just don't think he's going to be like a massive people mover or anything like that. But I think as far as why I was excited about that pick and we don't have to spend too much time on it, like you said, but I was happy that the giants didn't do anything crazy. Like take, and I don't want to even want to call it crazy, but like, you know, in past years, they might do something like take mm-hmm. crossover Neil with Neil on the board. And we're like, oh, what happened here? Well, you know, what? we got to trust them. The Giants really the Giants know what they're looking for. And we saw all the smoke about them taking cross. But in the end, they took the player who was, in my mind, clearly, you know, a safer bet than cross. And ultimately, to me, has even higher ceiling as well. So, yeah, I I've, we were talking before we went um, live for the, I was like, man, one of these days, the Giants are going to just you know, since we've been doing this, are just going to draft some of the first round that I don't like at all. And I was, yeah. I was, I was dreading cross. So, yeah. was, uh, and, and obviously I love Neil <laughs> to finish off day two. Um, do you think Azudu should start right away? No, I think, you know, that Bobby, I think Azudu is somebody who is going to be worked in more slowly than you would think for somebody who's picked that highly or, you know, that high in the draft. I think this was like, I put I put a tweet out, and it's like the first time since 89 the Giants took two offensive linemen in the first 75 picks, which is just crazy to me because, like, it's, it's such an obvious thing you should be doing more than once every 30 <laughs> years, whatever it was, <laughs> like, once every, yeah, 32 years. But happily, they finally did it. But while I like his athleticism and I like some of the things I've seen, 
Uh, obviously, you did a great breakdown on him. Nick did a great breakdown on him. I started to watch him and I started to like him. But I think there are issues that you'll see throughout his tape that make you that lead you to believe maybe he's somebody who you work in slowly, especially now that you have actual depth there with Lemieux looking completely healthy, which I think was a bit unexpected even from I don't know how you guys what you guys expected to go on there. I thought Lemieux was going to come along slowly from the injury. And now it's, it appears like he's got no physical limitations, at least from the OTAs today. He's got no physical limitations. He's right there working with the first unit. But I will say this as far as maybe he might get reps earlier than expected. They are working Garcia at center a little bit, which I didn't expect to happen either. And same thing with Bredesen. So I wonder if there's a plan there to have a competition there with Feliciano, who I guess I, I wouldn't say I'm not as high on as other people, but I just, from watching him, I don't think he's a lock at all to be their starting center all season. Yeah, we're not high on him either. Yeah, I mean, he's just not, he's not that good of a, like, he's fine. Like, he's an okay player. You, you need depth, but. I just feel like there could be more of a competition there than people realize than maybe at left guard. And so I would lean toward Lemieux starting there this year and Nizudu kind of getting that red shirt year. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets some reps at some point. So a lot yeah, of what we've... I, Go ahead, Bobby. I was just going to say, I, there's just things he needs, especially with his hands, like he needs to focus on becoming yeah. a good football player more so than they, you know, next week's opponent. Um, yeah. At least, at least to start. If he develops real quick throughout the season, then if you want to throw him in, go for it. But I'm in, I'm in no rush to play with Azudi. And like you said, they've got some depth now where it's not a, it's not he's not going to be forced to put in there just because they have to. A theory that we had, especially after the whole draft was over, um, is that Joe Shane was really leaning on his evaluations from Buffalo, and he was leaning on. You know the, the 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 relationships that he built with with guys in the meetings, the, the t- those top forty visits, really kind of leaning on those. And then lo and behold, it was Chris Pettit was fired. Uh, uh, you know, just I think after they signed their initial batch of UDFA. So it's like, oh well, maybe maybe that kind of theory was somewhat correct. Were you feeling that like after the draft was over? You know, maybe maybe like like Joe Shane wasn't trusting uh, or was only trusting like his evaluations and what he kind of got from Buffalo. A hundred percent. And you could just look at some of their later round picks and it's and it seems like, you know, you have the clear cut case that this is happening based on those picks because you have some like we had um forgetting his name from PFF. We had him on just before the draft and he'd like bang the table for uh who is the cor- the corner out of Fayetteville state who ended up going like earlier than expected in round four. He's like, this kid is so good. If you have those small school guys, you're really probably only going to take them. If you have scouts, you can trust. Cause those are the ones banging the table for these guys. And those are the ones who are saying, you have to take this guy. He's going to be much better than where he's project- where, where he's being drafted at right now. It's going to be a steal for us. And if you don't trust those scouts, like if those aren't your own scouts that you brought in, you're probably just going to go end up trusting yourself and lean on what your own evaluations are of this class and of these players. And so I think that's what he did. And we're seeing it obviously now, as you guys have mentioned, like we're seeing them, him start to bring in his own staff there. And we're going to see even more changes, I think in the front office, they're completely turning it over, which is good in my opinion, because obviously the old, it didn't work out with the old regime. And it's not like we have to, it's not like we can lean back on and be like, well, how about this? He hit a fourth round pick this year, a fifth round pick this year. The closest thing we really came to hitting on any of those was like Darius Slayton or Ryan Connolly before the injury, Eric. I guess potentially Shane Lemieux. So it's like, I'm fine with them turning it all over. And I think we'll see a different draft next year for sure. Yeah. We, we talked with a lot of Buffalo guys after we added Shane Dable and, and Bobby Johnson. And, um, so one of our listeners clipped their draft stream and it was like every player, of the Giants draft, like, Oh, that was a top 30 guy for the bills. And, and, you know, oh, and, and, and yeah. some, some other guys. So it definitely seemed, we try to not get into conspiracy. You know how it is with, Especially, you know, <laughs> with fans, it's like you just convince your things of like every little move means this. But after the draft, before where they were fired, me and Justin, like, I kind of believe in this conspiracy theory that Shane only trusted himself and, and very few people. And it kind of turned out to be true with the, the guys moved out, um, moved out afterwards. Um, and that kind of makes me concerned. Like, and I, we don't even need to like fully expand on it because, again, it's like it's like full on conspiracy theory. But. Your first draft as a GM is an extremely important one, and Joe Shane isn't necessarily in a unique situation where, you know, he's coming into a situation that is so, so bad and that he wants to bring in his own people. So it's not unique. This isn't the first time that this has ever happened where he's fought, where he's fired, a, you know, the director of college scouting, but it does kind of make me concerned about the long-term, pro- tra- you know, trajectory of this draft, even though we do like the players, you know, right now when, after it's all said and done, so... Yeah, I almost look at it the other side. It's interesting. I, I totally get your point of view there, Justin, but I almost look at it the other side. Like, you know, instead, 
the other option was leaning on the this past, you know, the scouts right. that they already had in place. And again, right. they just haven't done a good job with it. And that was the other theme I was I was going to say before that I was blanking on because I have like COVID brain right now. I had avoided <laughs> COVID for two and a, three years and I finally just came back from a trip to New Orleans and I got it. Which oh, how, just, how, how long have you been down with it? I just I I tested. I'm pretty sure I've had it for like two, two, three, four days now. I tested positive two days ago, so. Who knows That's when brutal, I first man. Got it, it almost killed me. I, I tested really? positive for the flu, but I'm almost sure I was, if that was wrong because I had every <laughs> symptom of code, not, yeah. not of the flu. <laughs> like, I was like, I've had the flu 10 times in my life. It's never been like this before. The brain fog is the weirdest thing because I'm just like not recalling things that I normally can just like pick up off the top of my head. But the other thing I was going to say about his theme that I really got ex- me excited about what Joe Shane did in his first draft. And I agree, Justin, there are some limitations with, you know, like using relying on his own valuations. But every pick to me, with the exception of some, even some, you know, even those later picks, with the exception of when you get deeper into day three, had a focus on stopping the pass or passing the football. Mm. And to me, that is just a great direction that this franchise is headed in because ultimately that's what wins football games. You can argue it either way. I mean, we tried this whole, like establish the run, do, you know, have you stop the run thing. This last regime, it just didn't work at all. There's still some examples of that working occasionally. Look, look, the 49ers have the most incredible run, scheme in the NFL and no one can stop it and they practice it really well and then they end up performing it really well and they have some outlier years but ultimately you have to stop you have to pass the ball and you have to stop the pass and I thought that was a big theme of this draft as well yeah and helping uh throwing the football and uh one of the more exciting draft picks we haven't talked about yet is Daniel Bellinger so basically a year one if you want to split it up into year one and then long-term uh projection for Daniel Bellinger how do you envision him being used or how do you envision his kind of his kind of career going? Yeah, it's interesting with Bellinger because he also fits into the the last theme that we haven't really talked about with Shane's draft, which is new for the Giants, which is investing heavily in super athletic players. Like if you looked at the collective RAS score, which I know, which look, the RAS score isn't the greatest metric. I understand that. Like I'll talk to Bobby off pod if I talk to him or Nick and the guys who really like dive so, so many hours into the tape and they'll be like, this guy just doesn't look nearly as athletic as his RAS score. I've learned it. to hate the RAS score. <laughs> yeah, because I know. I, I bet I, people I, who watch a ton of film, I can understand they would hate that. With Bellinger, I was like, I was like, uh, not the most athletic guy, but can move well. <laughs> and people are like, RAS score. How do you say he's not the most athletic guy? I'm like, damn it. Like this is every time. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, yeah, I know he has the exact same numbers as Travis Kelsey, but he doesn't look anything like Travis Kelsey on tape. So it's like, so how did that work? So I get it. He doesn't move like those guys, but he, he is in some ways a more athletic tight end than some of these guys. Like you watch like Jake Ferguson or you watch like even like Kolar, who I really like because I think Kolar can do some things in the red zone and can do some things as a possession guy. I feel like to me, when I watch those guys, uh, Bellinger has a little more pop and a little better movement skills, especially laterally. So I think that they're, there is a long-term path for him. I would just qu- caution Giants fans on expecting too much in year one, despite how bad this depth chart is at tight end. Because tight end, to me, at this put stage, with the exception of maybe the offensive tackle, but honestly, to me, it may be even more so than offensive tackle, is just the hardest transition uh, position to transition to at the NFL level for a variety of reasons, but mostly because if you're trying to play the Y position, you're going from trying to block guys down, block down guys who are like, 240 pounds on average or whatever he's especially if you're in his conference he's probably facing some edges that are like really light versus like guys who are like 280 or 275 and like just crushing you at the line of scrimmage and so i think there's still going to be some time it's going to take some time with bellinger to me he's an even more long-term pick than flot he's an even more long-term pick than mcfadden wow and some of these other guys just because i think the position just because the position he plays but i do really like his upside long term and i could be totally wrong like this tight end room is so shallow that it just might be a situation where it's like there is a role for him right away. We'll find I th- out. I think he's the one player where it's like I know I need to you know temper my expectations a little bit, but I'm not. Partly because, like you said, the tight end room is horrible. Yeah. I mean, they have no. He's their only Y tight end who can in block and and uh and like you said, t- blocking in the NFL it does take some time to grow. Even like like Caden Smith when he came, like he was he was not yeah. a good blocker at first, and he kind of grew into a decent one. Um. And the, and just the past few years of tight end play on the New York Giants has just been utterly frustrating. You know, with Ingram supposed to be, it'd be one thing if Ingram was a great receiving threat, but it's like he never was. You know, and then the drops and right. it was a uh, except for a little bit of 2019, and then Kyle Rudolph. 
might be my least favorite signing in the last four years was Kyle Rudolph. So it's Same. it's been a frustrating position. There's like we just got someone that reminds you of Kevin Boss or somebody, and you're like, it's we're back, baby. <laughs> yeah. But Boss, I will say this: Boss had a different frame than Bellinger, so I want to, and I feel like Boss bought that frame lended itself to playing the Y. Like I still have a little bit, a few questions at least about like, can he play the Y tight end position? Because you mentioned Smith, who got better as a blocker, but even so, it wasn't necessarily as like the Y tight end. It wasn't like traditional Y tight end blocking. It was the way they used him as a blocker that he did really well with uh, Caden Smith, and it was kind of like it's that backside. So it's like I'm just not so sold if Pellinger is going to hit the ground running, but like you said, easily the most, the player I'm most excited for based on the, based on how shallow that room is. So there was like 80 to 90, 10 personnel snaps that the bills took last year. And I think that was like the third most in the NFL. And when you break it down, you know, it's like, what is that? Five, six per game. And that, and that's a decent amount. You know, now talking about the trepidations that we have about the tight end room, is that, you know, 10, 10 personnel spread in the field, or are we going to go from running the most 13 personnel in the league the last two years to running the most 10 personnel in the league with the personnel and the depth chart that we got? Dear God, Justin, I can only hope because I don't care what your depth chart looks like. I don't care what your personnel is for the most part, unless you somehow have a team that has like Rob Gronkowski and Travis Kelsey on the same roster. I just, I am a big believer in going away from the 13 personnel and going away and going to not necessarily just 10, like even just heavy 11 with some mixing of 10 and 12 occasionally, or, you know, you bring in an H back, like spread the field out. This is how you, this I've always been a believer that not only spreading the field is going to help your offense overall, it based on the rules, like how the NFL has changed the rules. It's also going to help your run game. And my, there's a lot of studies that show it's easier to run out of spread formation. Less guys in the box. Personnel. Less guys in the box is going to help your run, especially if you have a runner like Saquon Barkley. That's your whole offense. So I think I'm really excited to see that. It might end up being a moot point, like you said, our, our whole debate, like Ken Bellinger went out. Like they might just not have too many tight ends on the field very often anyway in this offense. And I think you'll see it. You're seeing it already at OTAs. Like they're doing, you're running a lot of RPO, which is great because I think that's something Jones has proven he can do well at the NFL level. It's one of the things he's done best at as far as concepts go. And they're going to be using Barkley a lot in motion. And there was even something I saw today, like this is OTAs. I don't want to go crazy about him, but I do like seeing the personnel usages. And I saw something today with like Barkley motion down into the slot and breed in the backfield, things yes. of that nature. So there's just more examples of the Giants moving toward a layup based offense. That's what I keep, how I keep describing it. That's how I think this offense is going to be in year one. Everyone's like, Oh, you know, they're going to take a lot of shots downfield. That's I'm a little less sold on in year one because, you know, you listen to Greg Cosell talk about that bill's offense and, and you see it even when you watch that bill's offense, it's easier said than done to take shots downfield when you have Josh Allen versus when you have any other quarterback, because he could just sit in the pocket, let the pass rush eventually get there and then off his back foot, rip a ball. And I'm not, it's not so sure. Like that's something Daniel Jones can do. Most of Daniel Jones's successful throws have been from a clean bound space when he's able to kind of square shoulders into a throw. And so we'll see what happens there, but I think that we'll, we will see a, a, a more successful offense just because there's going to be more layup throws for the giants based mm. on the fact that, you know, they've made these decisions in personnel and they've made decisions with the play caller and whether it be, whether it ends up being Kafka or Dable, it doesn't matter to me. And that's going to help Jones. It's going to help the entire offense because what was, <laughs> there's a difference to me between quick hitting throws and the quick game, right? Like Jason Garrett had an entire quick game offense, but it was, it was a spacing based quick game where like eventually the defenses were able to just guess and sit on plays. It's a little harder to do when it's quick hitting, when you're getting the ball out really yep. fast and to, to space and des in, in design ways to try to get the ball into your playmakers hands so they could do stuff after the catch. So that's what has me most excited. I would say. Yeah, there was, there were times last year that what I would do, cause I really got tired of the whole, the Giants can't get the 15 to 19 or the 20 plus yard plays because of the offense line, the offense line, the offense line. Yeah, the offense line was bad. But what I did is I timed with the stopwatch and I put everything on video and I merged it up. And I was like, look, this 15 to 19 yard play or 20 plus yard play took the, the time to throw was 2.6 seconds. It was 2.7 seconds. That's average in the NFL. Like the average time to throw is around 2.6, 2.7 seconds. So not all these plays need to, you need to sit in there for three right. and a half seconds to throw the football. So that was a frustrating point the, uh, last year in the last couple of years that hopefully they can correct this year. So. Yeah, that's something you, Bobby, me, Nick have all been on for a while. Like just you need to run more mills. There's so many different concepts you can run that can aid your offensive line and give you an opportunity to throw it in field. So I don't want to make it seem like they're not going to have downfield opportunities, but I just think that could take a little more time. Yeah. I mean, Jake Fromm's only NFL touchdown came from a mills concept. Just Darius Slayton wide open. Um, 
And that will be his only career touchdown <laughs> of, of his NFL career. How <laughs> deflate? I, I want to because we're going to finish up here, and I want to ask you guys. How brutal was it covering the Giants of December last year? Because, I mean, one, like that's when I had COVID and almost died um, damn near. Like, I don't think we'll ever see a stretch like that December of just like, what the? Like, we our preview pods, you know, we do the preview yeah. pod every Friday. We're like, let's just talk about like Dave Gelman or the, whatever article came out on preview yeah. pods. And then we'll do a fantasy draft and, and call it a night. <laughs> Yeah, it was a really bad time. Actually, during that time, we had a fun interview with me, Justin, and Nick, where like he showed just how now now I'm he's bringing back memories because he had a picture of you just like dead on the couch trying. Yeah, to the record. Dolphins podcast <laughs> yeah, was me laying like, down on the couch. It's like once they got once they got to the Glennon from of the schedule, and then we got to just see the total collapse of of the offense. In my opinion, it was hard to do. I think the worst part for us was, or at least for me, was we do two podcasts a week just breaking down the all 22 film one on the offense, one on the defense. It was so not enjoyable watching that, that, that film. It was just some of the worst time I spent last year. Overall, I just had no, the defense was still kind of fun to watch, but once you got to the offense, it was like, you're not seeing too much. Like even like the kitchens came in, they tried to do a couple things. The first week kitchens came in, they tried to make Barkley, like the focal point of the offense. They were throwing him a lot of design passes and stuff. And it's like, that just went away that for some reason, they're just like, ah, forget it. Let's just go back to like what we have here, but we have nothing here. And it just was that combined with Joe judge, who I think just had a different mindset for how to win the games with what they had left, which, you know, case can be made. Look, they didn't have any other options, but to me, and I know you agree with this, both of you guys, there are always other options from a play calling standpoint, no matter what your personnel is. It doesn't just have to be, you have this personnel. All we can do is this. Well, no, if we know that's not going to score points and to create explosive plays, let's at least try the things that will create them. Will it cause some turnovers? Sure. But at least you have a chance to potentially score some points. And so it was, it was rough. I hope we never get to that point again. Cause I, I was the least that was the worst time I ever spent covering this team by far. <laughs> it was it was brutal. And that Bears game was just like first play, strip sack. Yep. Um Oh, okay, we're doing it. Like like I like, I, <laughs> I hope Nate Sol like Nate Soldier is the worst offensive lineman we ever watched because that was just like I mean, you, there's memes of him like with picnic, you know, like a picnic, you know, of him like sitting down enjoying a picnic on the field. Um <laughs> that happened multiple times over. Dan, where can people hear your your show? Yes, yeah, so you can listen into the Big Blue Banter podcast. It's a podcast I do with myself and Nick Filato. Like we mentioned, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's a all. It, we do a lot of things, but one of our key things is we break down the all twenty-two coaches film, just like Bobby and Justin do. Well, Bobby does it video wise. We do it on podcast wise twice a week during the regular season, and then otherwise in the off season, we do a lot of the same type of content that you'll see here and on other giant shows, but. Definitely check us out. It's the Big Blue Banter podcast with Blue Wire Network. You can find that anywhere, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes. And you can find my work. If you like fantasy sports, I cover fantasy sports for CBSSports.com. Do fantasy football, fantasy baseball, a lot of different fun things over there from the fantasy gambling standpoint. So check me out there as well. And then on Twitter at Dan Schneier, D-A-N-S-C-H-N-E-I-E-R NFL. Dan, always appreciate it. Um you coming on our show in 2019 was uh, like the first like nice bump after it was like Daniel Jones drafted nice bump, Dan Snyder uh, comes on the uh, show nice bump. So we always appreciate you coming on, um, and uh, looking forward to doing it again if, after the draft next year. Yeah, for sure. And we got to get you. We got to do a whole collaboration because every time we do one of these, like I know last year we did one with Justin. We always hear the same feedback. Like you guys need to do more big blue banter talking Giants collab. So we'll try to do it quicker than the last time. I say for this time. Sounds good. Appreciate you. Yep, thanks for having me on. All right, thank you to Dan Schneier for coming on from the Big Blue Bencher podcast. Always have a great time with him. And before we wrap up, we got to talk about Roman. So no matter what you're wearing, confidence starts on the inside. That's why it's important for men to think about their, their testosterone health early on. That's because testosterone is believed to affect everything from our libido to our blood health. Thankfully, Roman's testosterone support Supplements were designed by real doctors, not fake ones. Real doctors to make sure your body's maintaining its greatness. Feel confident from the inside out with Roman. All about men's health. They don't just have stuff with ED, erectile dysfunction. They, it is all about men's health, all encapsulating. Love that word. Love that word. So what I want you to do is I want you to go to getroman.com slash world. Talk Giants versus the world today. If approved, 
you'll get $15 off your first order of Roman T support. That's GetRoman.com slash world. GetRoman.com slash world. All right. We'll be back on Thursday or Friday. I was thinking about doing our 53-man prediction pod since we'll be going to North Carolina on Friday. Again, May 27th, Charlotte Motor Speedway. Um, just know that we're going to be towards the front. We and Justin are going to get there early. Towards the track. Yeah, close, very close to the track. We're going to get there early, and we'll give you, once we're there, we'll give you an exact location. But it's at, at Charlotte Motor Speedway towards the front of the track. Um, so that, you can bring your own uh, alcohol inside the stadium. Um, I don't think you can bring glass bottles, but, you know, you can bring you know bring some cans in there and a cooler or whatever. They're chill. Um, we're going to have merch, too. Yeah, we're going to sell merch. We're going to have a live uh, mailbag. So, you know, a live show, you'll be able to join in it. We'll have a couple extra microphones, too, so you can guys you guys can come and talk with us and just have a good time. And then buy the oh, – I keep on reminding you, buy the cheapest ticket, and then the, the stands don't get packed. So we're – and everyone packs towards the middle. We're going to go all the way to turn one where you can get the best look at, at the action. Um, it's, a, it's one of the best kept secrets about a NASCAR truck series race. So mm. – uh, Come join us. Come have fun. By the way, one of our Patreon members, JD, he has like a 90s, like 2000s cover band. They're performing at a Charlotte bar afterwards. He said to come through. So we might we might just do that afterwards oh, awesome. if, we're, yeah. if we're feeling up to it. You know, Yeah, so. truck race isn't that long, so we'll do it. We need like a couple. If anyone wants to, you know, drive my uh, rental car uh, soberly, let me know because I would <laughs> I would like to go to that. But I'm not, you know, I don't feel like paying for Ubers and stuff and I'm not going to. I'm not going to do the drinking and the driving. So uh, so be responsible. We appreciate you guys. We'll see you uh, on Friday. We'll see you in Charlotte. Until then, let's go Big Blue.